Okay, welcome back everybody. We now have uh, two keynote spe speakers for Saturday night, Robert Bouval now and Graham Hancock a bit later. So we're glad you're here to witness this. Robert has been involved in ancient Egyptology and many other subjects for the last few decades. He's done some groundbreaking research on Egypt, as you probably know from his book, The Orion Mystery, and many others such as Egypt Co. Today he's going to be discussing uh, a republish of his talisman book, The Master Game, which he actually co-authored with Graham, who's going to be speaking next. So we're going to get into some quite interesting esoteric subjects tonight. So please give a warm welcome to Robert Bouval. Uh, I'll make a little correction. Uh, there's not going to be anything esoteric or spiritual about this talk. Uh, it's exactly the opposite. But it's, it's a study that I've uh, begun uh, about 15 years ago. And uh, we decided to do a book. Uh, it was in 1997. We finally had the book published in 2006, uh, Hancock and myself. Uh, <coughs> we published it first under the name of Talisman, uh, but we realized uh, several years later uh, that uh, the book had forced us to research a topic that... Uh, this is wonderful. I mean, I love it because this year is a lot better than last year. Last year we had a motorcycle race outside. If you remember, the power did not work, and uh, there, were, there was some chanting with drums outside. So this is great, just music. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, the topic that we had to cover uh, to write Talisman led us to uh, investigate uh, the historics behind uh, the terrible event of September 11, 2001. And now, uh, the master game uh, has incorporated uh, a couple of chapters and some rewriting because it's a book, it's another unusual book, it's a book that attempts to, well, we call it intellectual archaeology. Or it's, it's history, the history behind the history. Uh, it was a lot of fun to research it, but it's so... Um, in my view, it's a book that should uh, open up uh, a confusion that is, uh, that is causing a lot of problem today in the world. Uh, I've just returned from Egypt. Uh, some of you may know, but I was born in Egypt. I was born in 1948, uh, in the days of the monarchy. So I've witnessed the first revolution in 52, which was the, uh, the fall of the monarchy and the placement of, the, um, of a military uh, government under Gamal Abdel Nasser, which lasted till uh, the 11th of February, which you've all witnessed on television. Uh, I've lived through all these years, uh, and what has, what has happened in the Middle East is, is, is amazing, but there's something that is not well understood, and I think uh, or I hope that the Master Game will, will open it up a bit. And that is, of course, the huge conflict that uh, uh, we're still facing, is the conflict between the Palestinian and the Israeli state. There is a serious problem here. There is a problem that um, we are not watching carefully. And a couple of weeks ago, the seriousness of the problem and the reality of the problem, uh, amazingly, uh, was heard on television globally when President Obama received the President of Israel and when he proposed the need to consider seriously the return of the borders to the 67 bo uh, state, uh, the President of Israel simply said no. And to me, it's an amazing situation the most powerful man in the world, the President of the United States, was told, no, I'm not going to do this. And that is a serious problem. And the reason why this no is so resounding is that uh, we have a situation where we have a rogue state at the moment, uh, armed to the hilt with nuclear power. 
On the other hand, we have Iran, which is dangerously coming close to having uh, nuclear power. And that is the real conflict that we might have to face. And that is the conflict we must defuse. And in order to defuse it, and to save this planet, because there's a lot of things going on, but this is the one that we have to watch. But we have to defuse it, and we have to defuse it fast. But in order to defuse it, we must understand the problem. And I'm always amazed that we're not understanding it. A few weeks ago, bin Laden uh, was killed. I'm showing the, the cover of the book, but in fact, what I wanted to show you, I think, comes right before it. This is a newspaper, an Arabic newspaper, published in London. It's called El Quds. El Quds, in Arabic, is Jerusalem. On the 23rd of February, 1998, a declaration was published. It is the declaration of jihad, of holy war, by Al-Qaeda. And in this declaration, it's very clear. What astounds me is when I do give talks like this to Americans, I'm going to talk in the States lately, it's amazing how people are not aware of this. In any case, this statement literally declares war and a holy war to recapture the Holy Land, or rather more precisely, Jerusalem. And the enemy that is considered the enemy of this uh, organization, and still is, is not just the United States. They use a very strange word. They use the word crusaders. A couple of weeks later, here in England, uh, one of the mullahs, the Egyptian mullah, uh, Hamza, the one with the blind eye that uh, we've seen so, ma so many times in the newspapers, made it even clearer. He said, our enemy is an American Zionist Masonic enemy. Now, it intrigued me why he would see, uh, I can understand Zionist, I could understand Americans to a certain point, and we will go through it here. What I couldn't understand is why they combine this with the Freemasons. And it may sound very conspiratorial, but there is a reason why this happened. And if we don't understand it, we're not going to defuse this problem. So I want to, to do this tonight. It's not a spiritual talk, and I apologize, but it is the subject of... Uh, of the master game, and I think you will enjoy it because it takes us through a kind of uh, rat, <coughs> rat alleyways and strange places uh, that is part of this story. And here's the full article. It's on the internet, by the way. You can sort of fish it out. The story actually begins <coughs> in 1000 BC when. Uh, according to uh, biblical writings, King David established the kingdom of Jerusalem in the land that we call today Palestine. I'll, I'll go very quickly through the, uh, the events. In 950 BC, King Solomon built the first temple. In 586 BC, Solomon's temple is destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the first destruction of the first temple. In 515 BC, Zerubbabel starts the second temple. In 63 BC, the Romans capture Jerusalem and King Herod takes power. And this is the event that leads to uh, the uh, establishment of Christianity. And in 70 AD, the catastrophe. The Jewish revolt against Rome, it's crushed viciously by the Romans and the second temple is destroyed. What remains, still remains today, is the Wailing Wall. That was the situation in 70 AD. So far, no problem. Palestine is in Roman hands. The temple is destroyed. 
the Jews start spreading, the Hebrew nation starts spreading, uh, s they begin to move around, not so much yet. But another nation rises in the seventh century, the nation of Islam in Arabia rises. And what you're looking here is a map of the Islamic uh, empire at around the beginning of the seventh century, in the middle seventh century. The problem is there that according to the Quran, whether true or not, the Prophet Muhammad is taken by a magical horse, flown from Medina to Jerusalem, alights on the Temple Mount, and from there takes a journey into the heavens. And there he meets the various prophets, he meets Moses, he even meets God. And on his descent declares that he has received the instructions that Islam will be the religion of the world and that Jerusalem is one of the holy sites. We have a problem from that point on. Three major religions claim this real estate. More specifically, the Temple Mount. Christianity, of course, because of the events of the New Testament. Judaism, because of the establishment of the Temple and the placing uh, within the temple of the Holy of Holies, the Arch of the Covenant. Uh, Graham Hancock may tell you about it when he comes. And now Islam. In the year 7th uh, century, an army is raised by Caliph Omar, the second Caliph of Islam. The caliphs are a bit like the Pope. They are the legitimate uh, uh, inheritors and leaders of the Islamic religion. The second caliph takes Jerusalem. At the time, the Roman Empire has weakened and Jerusalem falls into the hands of the caliph and he builds Omar's mosque, uh, better known today as the Dome on the Rock. It literally stands on the rock where Isaac was going to be crucified by Abraham. It actually stands on this rock. There is a rock there that is considered the most sacred relic, not just for the Muslims who believe that this is the spot where Muhammad ascended to heaven, but the Jews believe that it is this spot where Abraham was going to commit his uh, sacrifice. And another mosque is built, the Aqsa Mosque. they still stand there. So now we have, from the seventh century onwards, the Islamic edifices considered the third holiest sites in the world, after Mecca and Medina, and the uh, Wailing Wall. There is a photograph, I think, which combines them both. You can actually see them together. There they are. They're that close. Now the problem starts really not with the Jewish nation that is all around the world. The problem starts with Christianity. Christianity gets it in its head, starting from the 10th century onwards, that it has to recapture the holy sites. For 500 years, there was terrible genocides. Five crusades were mounted. The first crusade, in a sense the super 9-11, Uh, was mounted uh, by the uh, knights. Uh, one of the orders that I'll be speaking about, of course, is our famous order of the Knight Templars, because this leads us to where I want to go. Uh, <coughs> it's, it's frightening what happened. Uh, the capture of Jerusalem in uh, 1011, in 10,011, witnessed a genocide that even today will make us shiver. Uh, there are chroniclers of the time that speak of the streets 
being so full of blood that they were knee deep in blood. Heads were all over the place, arms cut. The Knights massacred the whole population of Jerusalem. We, we tend to forget this. This is the moment where the, these problems begin to, to really get into the psychic of these people. Uh, this is a, an, an etching uh, showing the, uh, the beheading by the thousands of, uh, of uh, Saracens, of uh, Muslim knights. Uh, one of the strange orders that um, comes up during these events of the Crusades in the 12th century is the order of the uh, Knights Templar, the Knights of the Temple of Solomon. Uh, I won't go through the details because I'm sure you all know it, but very briefly, uh, two knights somewhere in the north of France, coming from Alsace, uh, rides to Jerusalem. They eventually are joined by a few. There are a contingency of about 10 or 12. And they make it to Jerusalem and offer their services to the king of Jerusalem. Amazingly, they're not only accepted as, uh, as fighting knights to protect the, uh, the pilgrims, but they're actually given as place to uh, set their headquarters the Temple Mount. They actually set their headquarters in the Aqsa Mosque <coughs> and the, the Mosque of, of Omar. There is an attempt by the Muslim to recapture Jerusalem. It fails. Uh, they capture it temporarily. This goes on for quite a long time till finally, 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 a, <coughs> a Muslim knight, coming from Egypt, by the way, born in the city of Takrit, oddly enough, where uh, Saddam Hussein was born, uh, named Salah din known to you as Saladin, raised a giant army and captured Jerusalem in 1182. Uh, he, in sp uh, quite contrary to the, to, the, to the bloodbath that we saw in the uh, days uh, when the Christian took Jerusalem, he's very chivalrous. He allows the um, Christians and the Jews to leave the city or to stay and pay tax. Uh, some of you may have seen it. They've shown it very nicely in a film called The Kingdom of Heaven. And uh, <clears throat> since then, since then, Jerusalem has been in the hands of a Muslim population. What happened to the Christian uh, desire? An idea came and uh, solved the problem. It wasn't necessary anymore to recapture Jerusalem. The idea was that we could have a sort of new Jerusalem elsewhere. There was an attempt even to set up a new Jerusalem in London. You may be interested. The idea that it wasn't necessary to go there and go through all these genocides. And everything was nice and quiet, at least from that point of view, for quite a long time. This is the background history, and now we come to the modern history. Uh, I presume many of you know the story of the Nine Templars. Uh, they had to return in shame. Uh, their last battle was uh, on the 4th of July in uh, 1182. Uh, <coughs> these dates are very strange because they keep cropping up in, uh, in the Al-Qaeda events and the events that lead to this problem that we have. Uh, in any case, they returned to Europe. They set up um, their base in France, in Paris. Uh, they become rather uh, very powerful. They, they, they seem to have had a lot of finances, a lot of theories about them bringing the treasures of the temple to, uh, to Paris. In any case, uh, they form a power within Europe that threatens the King of France. There is a mass arrest of the Templars on the 13th of, uh, Oct uh, of October uh, in, uh, in 1307. Uh, and from there on, they disappear from history. Rumors, of course, all sorts of theories. They went to Scotland. Uh, they established a base in the United States. Uh, all this is speculation, but the night appeared then. But their ideologies 
I'm skipping a bit, get absorbed in, uh, <coughs> in a new society that develops here in England uh, in the uh, 17th century, which is Freemasonry. Uh, I'm going to move fast here. What you're seeing here is uh, Benjamin Franklin, one of the founding fathers of uh, the United States in, uh, in his Masonic regalia. Uh, George Washington. In fact, many of the founding fathers were very, very taken. They say that the American Constitution was probably drafted uh, on the lines of the Masonic Constitution. Uh, certainly, the, uh, the, the Bill of the Rights of Man in France uh, has a lot of the Masonic uh, ideologies in it, fraternity, equality, and so forth. Uh, some interesting tidbits here. Uh, you're looking at an etching of the uh, placing of the cornerstone of the capital. Oddly enough, the date intrigues me, because you will see this date comes up or similar dates, 13th of October, the Templar date, the, the arrest of the, the Templars a couple of centuries earlier. Uh, American Freemasonry was heavily, heavily imbued by Templar ideologies. Uh, all sorts of theories have come out with the, with the design of Washington. I'm sure, again, you've read Dan Brown's books and various other books of this kind. The White House inaugurated uh, on another Templar date and now we move to the real problem. Everything was okay. The idea of recapturing Jerusalem had gone. Jerusalem was no more a problem. There was no more conflicts, or at least minor conflicts. And then we come to the year 1790. And a very strange affair occurred in France. And this is where the research becomes interesting. Uh, in, the 17, in the 1890s, France, was particularly anti-Semitic, it's well known. And there was a scandal that almost split the country into a civil war involving one single man. He was called Alfred Dreyfus. Dreyfus was a sergeant in the army. He was accused of spying for the Germans. In fact, he was arrested and accused of this apparently because he was a Jew. Uh, the story uh, begins to hit the newspapers. The government is accused of all by all people by Emile Zola, the famous French writer, who wrote a piece, uh, you, again, you can find this on the internet. He wrote a piece called J'accuse, I accuse. He accused the French government of anti-Semitism. Uh, they accused him of, uh, of being a traitor. He had to leave, leave the country, he came to England. But that article caused such a fuss that all the world press got involved. And uh, eventually, uh, the life sentence that was passed on this Albert Dreyfus uh, was uh, removed and he was pardoned. But while the affair was going on, a journalist turned up in to follow the story. He was, sent, he was sent from Germany and his name was Theodor Hertz. Theodor Hertz, uh, in a few years from then, in, 17, uh, in 1897, would found the Zionist organization, which eventually would lead. He was so much uh, influenced by the Dreyfus affair, he was so much disgusted by the anti-Semitism that was going on in France, that he decided to form the Zionist organization. Uh, and here starts a problem. He sets up the idea that the uh, Jewish nation, or rather the Jewish people that are in diaspora, there were Jews in Russia, there were Jews in America, there were Jews in Hungary, in France, everywhere, are not separate. They belong to a nation that all Jewish people must consider themselves a nation. Now all this is very good, but unfortunately it revived the desire to recapture Palestine. And this is where the problem begins again in modern times. After many, many centuries of quasi-calm, the idea of recapturing that holy land is revived with a vengeance. What makes things rather annoying is that roughly at the same time, in 1905, a document circulated from Russia around Europe 
It's known as the Protocol of the Elders of Zion. It probably is a fake, but unfortunately it's taken very, very seriously and was taken very seriously at the time and still is taken very seriously by the Arabs. This document proposes or exposes a huge world conspiracy by the Zionists to take over and the Masons together to take over the world using the financial institutions. Whether true or not, that document caused and will cause and is causing a lot of problems. Uh, I have worked many, many years in Saudi Arabia. I worked in Sudan. I've lived many years. I've actually lived 40 years in the Middle East. And it's kind of sad that in some of the more radical states, like Saudi Arabia, this document is still not just being circulated, it's actually taught in schools. When you go to the Middle East, in some of, even of the most balanced and open-minded countries like Dubai, like uh, Abu Dhabi, it's amazing how many people, well-educated people, will tell you that they are convinced that there is a Zionist, Masonic, American conspiracy against them. It is kind of frightening. And the question is, hence why we wrote this master game, is to understand why really do they think that? One can understand a bit the background, yes, uh, there is a Zionist organization, but why do they bring in the Masons? Because of this document, but something else, something else happened later on. <coughs> we now move to the beginning, <coughs> the middle of the First World War, <coughs> and uh, when the Germans and the Turkish Ottoman Empire is conquered, a large swathe of the world, and particularly the Levant, is partitioned into uh, mandates. Parts are given to, to France, France takes Tunisia and Morocco, uh, Italy takes uh, Libya, and England is given the mandate of Palestine. And it is then, by that time, that the Zionist organization had set its base in England, in Manchester, the head of the uh, Zionist organization at the time was Baron Rothschild, uh, the one of the big... Uh, Baron Rothschild was a huge asset to the uh, war effort. He financed a huge chunk of the war effort, personally. And there's a moment in history that will change everything. Lord Rothschild happens to be particularly friendly with the minister... <coughs> your uh, foreign secretary, Lord Balfour. They're a pro they, they meet somewhere. The idea comes that they will propose uh, to the King of, of England uh, the idea of forming or approving a state for the Jewish people in Palestine. Uh, a letter is drafted to the King and by Lord Rothschild. It's handed over by Lord Balfour to the king. And the king's reply, uh, here is, by the way, Lord Rothschild, and here is the letter, signed by, it is addressed to Lord Rothschild, head of the organization. It says, I have much pleasure. Can you read that, by the way? Or let me read it to you, because it's, it's a landmark letter and we have to wake up to all this because like I said a huge situation is developing because of the Egyptian revolution the Egyptian revolution has re-demanded the youth of Egypt are re-demanded that the uh, state of Israel the state of the Palestinian state be reinstalled there's a very very serious problem brewing I have much pleasure in conveying to you on behalf of His Majesty's government, the following declaration of sympathy with the Jewish Zionist aspiration, which has been submitted to and approved by the cabinet. Quote, His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavor to facilitate this achievement of this objective. It being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. 
that is known as the Balfour Declaration. It was signed on the 2nd of November 1917. On the strength of this letter begins the Jewish immigration into Palestine. At the time, there is 700,000 Arab Muslim Palestinians living in Palestine. Do you notice something about this letter? Or rather, do you notice something that is missing? The word Arab is not used. It's as if they don't exist. I want to say this because very often when I give this talk, there is a, I, I hope I don't have it here, but I've given this talk many times and I get a bit of a disturbance in the crowd and some people think I'm anti-Semitic or, or whatever. There is a clear distinction and we must recognize it between the idea of Zionism, of Israeli and Jewish. They're three different things. And being anti-Zionist or being anti-Israeli does not mean you are anti-Jewish. It is extremely important because every time one brings up the Palestinian problem, you're being flung this anti-Semitic argument. It is not right. There is a nation that has been displaced. And for the last 60 years, they've lived in ghettos. They have been left and ignored with all sorts of false promises. And it's stirring up now. And the danger now is that the people who are dealing with it are armed with nuclear weapons. This is the problem. The, <coughs> the immigration into Israel starts. You know the famous story of the Exodus? They come by droves. Now, one sympathizes, of course. There has been terrible genocide after the Second World War in Europe. Terrible, terrible genocide. It's awful what happened to the Jews in Western Europe. But it is not the Palestinians who did it. And this is the crazy thing about the situation. Are you enjoying this talk or? Yeah. Uh, take, I'm, take, I'm moving ahead here because I'm, I'm not going to be politically correct. It's about time we face the problem head on. Things are not pretty. <coughs> During the, 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 the British mandate and before the Second World War, the Haganah is established. It's a terrorist organization that eventually became the first government of Israel. The Haganah and the <coughs> and the Zionist organization. <laughs> Excuse me, I have a bad cough. <coughs> this is the bombing of the King uh, David Hotel. Uh, 90 people were killed, mostly British. There was terrible, terrible things going on. The, <coughs> the Haganah was determined to... Yeah, it's okay, thank you. Uh, the Haganah and various uh, uh, movements military movements that were brewing were determined to move out the Palestinians. There was genocides, villages were, were attacked, uh, but they wanted the British out as well. They wanted the British out, and the British were beginning to be fed up of this. Uh, they were trying to arbitrate between the two. Uh, they got the, the, the worst of the, of the lot. Uh, there was ambushes of British uh, uh, army. Uh, it, it really went on, till finally, finally the British after the Second World War, wanted no more of this. And they declared that their mandate of Palestine would end at midnight on the 14th of May, 1948. Let me tell you the story now. Uh, at the time, the man heading this movement, the provisional Israeli government was headed by Ben Gurion, who eventually became the second president of Israel. The first president was Wiseman. Uh, here is Haim Wiseman, who was head of the Zionist organization based now in Washington. It's the end of the Second World War. The League of Nations changes its status to the United Nations and the United Nations has a big decision to make. What to do with the Palestinian problem? 
And what is brewing now is that the British are going to go away and they're going to leave the matters in the hands of the people there who are already are at each other's throat. Enter the President of the United States, Harry Truman. Now, the annoying thing with Harry Truman is that he wasn't just President of the United States. He was a 32nd degree Scottish Rite Freemason, one of the highest grades you can attain in this society. Uh, whether it's a coincidence or not, he happened to be also the 32nd President of the United States. Harry Truman had already done something that one would say this decision must have been it's a decision that really only God can take. Harry Truman had to make a decision in 1945 whether he was going to or not launch the first nuclear attack on Japan. The decision was made in the positive. Two nuclear warheads were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They knew beforehand that the destruction would be horrific. They had estimated that at least 100,000, if not more, people would be killed instantly. Can you imagine being the person who has to make this decision? How do you sleep on the night you make that decision? Because you're going to make a decision that, in my view, only God must make. No man can decide if 100,000 people are going to be killed. We live in this crazy world, and yet the decision was taken, admittedly to shorten the war. But what a decision, because now he's about to take another decision, another decision that for 2,000 years the Jews around the world have been waiting for, the return of the Jewish nation and the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. The United Nations is extremely wary because Arab countries bordering uh, <coughs> the future Israel, bordering Palestine, immediately declare that they have formed a coalition, Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq. They have joined their armies and should, should Ben Gurion declare a state an independent state of Israel, they will immediately go to war. The United Station, Nations decide not to allow and not to approve this, to give it time so that they can negotiate. But there is very heavy lobbying in the White House, extreme heavy lobbying by the Zionist organization. By the way, here is Truman with his, uh, with his uh, Masonic outfit. Who opposes this is the Secretary of State. George Marshall, the hero of the Second World War, the man who understood all military strategies. It is a crazy thing to do. A new colonial era is about to open if the decision is made. He foresees a huge problem that will not be settled. And he was right. We haven't settled it yet. But in spite of this, in spite of this opposition, this is what happens. At 6 o'clock in the morning, Uh, I won't bother here, but he, uh, Truman happened to be surprisingly influenced by a young man in the White House, Mark Clifford. He just published his memoir, and now we know the inside story. He died uh, a couple of years ago. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, on the 14th of May, the 14th of May, 1948, Ben-Gurion reads the Declaration of Independence at the Knesset. You can see above the photograph of Theodor Herzl, the founder of the Zionist organization. Bear this in mind because I'm going to leave you with a very intriguing puzzle, which you will go home and try and solve, okay? It's very bizarre. And funny enough, it doesn't involve, it's in Paris, of all places. Dan Brown would love this. 11 minutes, 11 minutes later, it is 6 a.m. in Washington. 
11 minutes after this declaration, Truman decides to personally, personally write this letter. It's six lines. It is in the Truman Museum. You can get it on the internet. The government has been informed <coughs> that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and the recognition has been requested by the provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state and he wrote the new Jewish state. He barred it with his own hands, the new state of Israel. That was that. Now, if you are an Arab and you are told that a decision like this is taken without consulting Congress, without consulting anyone, just 11 minutes later, and uh, the person who took it is the President of the United States, with heavy lobbying from the Zionist organization at the time, Wiseman was there in the White House screaming blue murder, and that he is a 32nd degree Mason, what would you think? Your conclusion would be that there is a Zionist, Masonic, American plot against the Arabs. Now, whether there is or not, I'm not saying there is, but it certainly looks like one, and that's what the Arabs believe. In 1967, Israel <coughs> invades the Sinai. It takes a huge swathe of territory belonging to Egypt and Palestine. It is the famous 67 borders. They take the whole of Sinai and the Gaza Strip. And the big drama. They capture and appropriate Jerusalem. After nearly a millennium in the hands of the Muslims, Jerusalem becomes part of the Israeli new state. And that is the problem. And the problem is that the Arabs believe that they are confronting a Zionist, Masonic, American plot. Uh, you know, <coughs> I, was, I don't know if you remember, I mean at my age I remember very well. Anybody above 60 here? <laughs> oh, one. <laughs> oh, two. <laughs> well, not bad. Uh, well, uh, this is 1967. <coughs> That's the year, by the way, I came to England. I actually had to leave Egypt because I was from a Belgian-British family and there was a lot of problems. Uh, Nasser broke diplomatic relations and I came to England. By the way, you might be interested. I mean, to me, walking around today was like England in 1967. The whole of England was like this. <laughs> it was. <laughs> Since then, the Arabs have been very displeased because there is negotiations after negotiations and promises after promises and discussion after discussion and Camp David, not Camp David, but the problem has not been solved. The reason the problem has not been solved is that Israel will not relinquish two things. It will not return or allow Jerusalem to become a territorial, a national, international territory belonging to the United Nations. So nobody fights over it. That's one. And the other, you've heard it at the beginning of the talk, they said, no, we are not going to go back to the 1967 borders. Now, what happened in the last 10 years? Terrible. The Iraqi war, I don't want to go into that, and emerges this character, whom you've seen at the beginning, takes on, takes on with a terrorist organization, this Zionist Masonic American enemy. And we have ignored it. He actually published it. He said, I've declared war against the, you. You'd think that all sorts of precautions would have been taken, but of course, 9 11 happened. 9 11 happened. I don't want to talk about him, he gets me uh, really pissed off. <laughs> um. But here is adding fuel to the fire. On the day of his inauguration, George W. Bush takes his presidential oath on the Masonic Bible 
from the Masonic Lodge of New York. Again, the Arabs say, what the hell is going on here? And comes that fatal day. Two targets, the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. I remember at that time I was writing uh, uh, Talisman with Graham Hancock uh, and uh, like everybody else, uh, my wife called me and said, I come down, come and see what's going on on TV. And I see these Twin Towers burning and what the hell is going on? But what intrigued me immediately, I got a phone call from an American friend of mine. He said, this is very strange. Uh, the Pentagon was hit as well. The Pentagon was hit as well. And oddly enough, on the Pentagon, you'll find it's still there, is a plaque saying that it was the cornerstone was laid uh, with the Masonic ceremony. They used to do that very often in the States. The, the, the Washington Memorial Monument is done, the Capitol, all this. On the 11th of September, 1941. The date chosen is weird. It's just one of those things that bugged me. It is a strange coincidence, to say the least. So I decided with Graham, I said, listen, let's just investigate this the way we normally do. Is Graham here, by the way? Ah, you're here. <laughs> Can you give a clap to my co-author who's sitting silently there? Uh, <clears throat> It's, it's one of those things that, you know, to me, coincidences don't work that way, but maybe it's a coincidence, maybe it was. And we decided to investigate purely as one would investigate anything. Look at first the, 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 the crime scene. I mean, let's look. And to me is why would they want to choose these two targets? Now, because we were writing about the history of Freemasonry and we were investigating uh, <coughs> the Templars and so forth, <coughs> for our book Talisman, I knew, and uh, I do give talks very often to Masonic Lodges, although I'm not one, in case they never ask me. <laughs> Apparently I'm not good enough. No, no, it's because I talk too much. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I knew that if you would state to a Freemason, Twin Towers, and a pentagon, or twin pillars and a pentagon, the word that comes to his mouth is the Temple of Solomon. That's the first thing that comes to his mind. It's very simple. It's because, according to legend, the Temple of Solomon had two pillars, known as Boaz and Joachim, and the altar inside was in the form of a five-pointed star or a pentagon. Let me show you this. By the way, that's a picture of the Scottish Rites. That's me taking a big risk. If I disappear, you know where, who got me. Now, here is a classic, uh, they call them uh, tracing boards. They're like prayer rugs, if you like, like. And they're put on the floor to perform the rituals, the ultimate ritual, which is the rising of a mason. And uh, basically, it's supposed to represent the Temple of Solomon uh, with two pillars and a pentagon representing the Holy of Holies. I, you must admit that it's a pretty odd choice of target uh, considering the date, because the date brings us back to 11th of September 1941, which is bang in the middle of the Second World War, and at the time when President Roosevelt with Vice President Truman were seriously negotiating with the Zionist organization about the formation of the State of Israel. Uh, 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 some, some private uh, conversations were published recently, again on the net, wonderful thing the net, you get everything, uh, where uh, the uh, advisor to Roosevelt publishes discussions that he had with Roosevelt at the time, and it's quite frightening what Roosevelt had in mind. He actually proposed that a wall should be built all around Palestine to keep the Arabs out and things like that. It's incredible that this sort of thing was going on, and it's weird that there is this connection. Is it possible 
that 9-11 is a message. They're actually attacking the Zionist, Masonic, American enemy because what they fear most and what is indeed the problem is that Temple Mount. The two holiest shrines of Islam are still there and they're in the hands of the Israelis. And you may not know this, but there are many organizations who are pumping big money to have these monuments removed so they can rebuild the Temple of Solomon. That is the dream, the final conclusion of the Zionist movement. Now, I don't know, maybe it's all hocus pocus and conspiracy theories, but it's really almost a mythical problem that we need to understand because we're not going to get to the bottom of how to solve this. Uh, how do we remove this desire from the Israelis to want Jerusalem or the Muslims to want Jerusalem? We've done it with the Christians. We don't want it anymore. All right? It's okay. We're quite happy leaving Jerusalem to whoever wants it there. But there are two nations that want it. And they are in opposition. And one of them is armed with nuclear weapons and the other one is arming itself with nuclear weapons, and in the middle is Egypt. And Egypt is the buffer state. Egypt for 30 years under President Mubarak has withheld its priestity <laughs> peace treaty with, with Israel, and everything was okay, as long as this peace treaty was honored. But no more. There is long talk in Egypt now to renegotiate this peace treaty, and to demand again the rights of the Palestinians. And this is what Obama very clearly understands, especially with the uh, Arab Spring going on. He has to react, but unfortunately he was told no. And the person who told him no has military armaments, warheads ready. It's very clear, they've made this declaration in 1973 during the, the 73 war with Egypt that if Israel is ever threatened in its borders and there's a risk of invasion, they will use the warheads. They will. That's it. Obama knows this. So we've got to defuse this. We've got to find a way to somehow say it's not important to have this piece of rock because that's what it's all about. It's a piece of rock on a mount. That's the craziness about it. We've got to somehow do it. I don't know the solution, but that is the solution if somebody finds it in the minds of the Arabs. If somehow somebody finds that solution, he will solve that problem, which is leading us slowly, slowly to a very serious catastrophe. I want to leave you with one thing that has intrigued me lately. Let me just move a bit faster here. Now, I want to say this because there's lots that comes out, but. I'm hoping that you're going to read the book and, and discover it for yourself. The location of the, uh, of the white of the, the, the Pentagon is very odd. The choice of its shape. Uh, all this comes into play and we discuss it in the, the Master Game. But I won't go through it now. We're going to run out of time. For example, just you might be curious, the 32nd degree Masons, of which Truman was one and so was Franklin Roosevelt, use a Pentagon for their symbol. The other is that in the 32nd degree rituals there is a Masonic army to defend Jerusalem formed of five armies that reside in a pentagonal building. This is what we have. It's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's too much smoke behind all this. I don't have the picture, unfortunately, but I will describe it for you. I'm going to leave you with this one, because something happened while I was with Graham Hancock on a tour. Am I hogging your time, Graham? Nah. I'm, I'm on a 10. You're on a 10? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> so I can take a bit more time. Are you, are you, yep. is it interesting for you, all this? <laughs> no, come on, a bigger yeah, so I get encouraged. This is the real thing. This is, this is what's going on now. And we, we've learned one thing uh, in, in Egypt. 
Egypt has raised me. I lived in Egypt nearly 40 years, and I would have never, never imagined what happened in January and February this year. We have discovered something quite extraordinary. We can change things. We can do it. The people, you, can do it. If we, all of us, all of us understand this problem and say, we want to defuse this problem. Mr. Obama and Mr. Benjamin Netanyahu, negotiate, please. Enough of this, because if Iran ever gets nuclear power, we're in trouble. We have to do it, because they're not doing it. They're procrastinating. It's 60 years. But anyway, I want to leave you with this one. While on cruise, a young lady came to me and said I was in Paris. Now, one of the things we talk a lot about in, in the Mastery game is these talismanic monuments that are all over the world. Obelisks in London, on the embankment, in Central Park, all Egyptianized monuments in front of the Louvre uh, pyramids, uh, the Washington Memorial, an obelisk, uh, it's weird stuff. And we began to visualize them as talismans. Now, it takes a while to understand talisman, but I will do it very quickly so you know what I'm getting at. I think I might have it. Um, uh, you, can you help me here, perhaps? There was another file. I'll start the story, and I, let's see if I can get the pictures. I was in Saudi Arabia in 1981. It's a very weird story, this. And I was uh, running an office, uh, a commercial office for a construction company, and I sent my secretary to buy airline tickets with Saudi, uh, I had to take an internal flight. Uh, can we go on the... Uh, there's another file I'm trying to find, rather than this file. I don't know if you copied it. Stick. Yeah, I don't know if you took it. It's on the memory stick rather than on... Go a bit further. Is that it? Well, no, I don't know if he's got it. It's Saudia. Talk. Blah, blah, blah. Talk one. No, it's not here. Never mind. This is the story. We can't find the picture, but I'll describe it. Um, he came back to me from uh, the agency and said there's something very strange. Uh, we were told that all the uh, travel agents must not sell tickets uh, of the Saudia airline. And the airports have been closed. Uh, no more flights. And I thought, damn it, there's a coup d'etat. Uh, I'm caught in, in one of those again. I've been in many coup d'etats around the world, by the way. And, but it turned out that it was something rather odd. The king of Saudi Arabia, King Khaled at the time, was very religious, was about to board the Saudi Arabian airline. And as he was about to step and go in the plane, his mutawa, mutawa is uh, the bearded guy who stays near him and reads the Quran behind him, said, stop. You cannot go on this flight. Now, you may or may not know this, but crucifix are banned in Saudi Arabia. Churches are not allowed to be built. You cannot perform any other religion in Saudi Arabia other than Islam. If you enter Saudi Arabia wearing a crucifix, they'll take it away from you. He said to the king, you can't go on this flight because on this airplane is painted the Christian cross. And the king said, this is weird. Where, where, where? Everybody stopped and said, where is it? What the Mutawa, this uh, religious priest, had seen was a phenomenon we call image in ground phenomena. Rather than seeing the letter SA that formed the Saudea line, he saw the blank space between the two letters. And it actually formed, if I had it, I'll show you, it's very obvious. It formed a white cross. Once he saw it, everybody saw it. That's it. Everybody saw it on tickets, on, on billboards, on napkins. It was everywhere. Saudi Arabia was submerged with crucifix. M more annoyingly, on the Saudi Ar Ar Arabian airline, the king's own plane. Now, whether it was true or not, didn't matter. That innocent thing became a very powerful talisman. It began to spread like an intellectual virus. I remember after two days, it was the, the joke of the town. Everybody was talking about, have you seen the ticket, you know? And, it would have gone on forever. The king had to do something, and indeed he did. He ordered that every sign, every sign on every aeroplane, every
the napkin be destroyed and they've changed the sign. You can find it also on the internet. You find the old and new. It is a true story, I was there. That is the power of a talisman. The power of a talisman. And that's what we were investigating. There are, you can create an object, the Great Pyramid. The Great Pyramid in the millennium. Wow, what a talisman. They were going to lower a golden capstone on top of the Great Pyramid. And um, Jean-Michel Jarre was going to project an eye with laser light. The eye on the pyramid with a golden capsule landing on it is, that's it. It's the, the supreme being of the Freemasons. Whether intended or not, it would have done the same thing as it did in Saudi Arabia. It would have been in, plastered in every single newspaper. And of course, in this case, the Arab newspapers, the radical newspaper, picked it up. And there was huge accusations of plots and all this. One never knows whether it is deliberate or not. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Now, sometimes there is a deliberate talisman inserted somewhere. For example, Dan Brown and others have suggested that Leonardo da Vinci placed one of these talismans on the picture, on the painting of the Cena in Milan. He put, according to some, a third, a thirteenth uh, disciple who happens to be a woman, or according to some. And what do you have? Wow, we have uh, the Da Vinci Code, we have uh, uh, the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, and we have movies and the whole thing, and everybody's talking about this. Whether intended or not, it looks like this was intended. What I'm trying to tell you is that you can use an object if it is an object known. And, uh, now, the Great Pyramid, of course, is one of them. But there are many of these strange monuments around the world that may indeed be talismans these obelisks that you see in various parts. Now, let me tell you this. We were very intrigued when we wrote Talisman when we found out that in 1998, Jacques Chirac invited President Mubarak to Paris with the uh, Minister of Culture of Egypt. And the idea was that they were going to celebrate to do a ceremony at the Place de la Concorde where there is the obelisk that came from the Luxor Temple. There's an obelisk standing in the Place de la Concorde in Paris, which has come from Egypt in 1836. And they were going to place a golden capstone, which they have, on top, and they wanted President Mubarak to be there. And he was. Amazingly, the date chosen for this ceremony was the 14th of May, 1998. Now, if you remember, we said at the talk that this is the date of the founding of the State of Israel. It is a date considered by the Arabs as the day of catastrophe, not a celebration. You probably saw it on television hardly a few days ago. There was huge riots in, in Gaza and huge ri riots in Egypt on that day because to them it's the day of catastrophe. It's quite amazing that President Mubarak was willing to participate on that day in a ceremony involving the obelisk. But... But 1998 wasn't just any year celebrating. It was the 50th anniversary of the State of Israel. Now that already is intriguing because normally the Egyptian Ministry of Culture would have not accepted because it would have been an insult to the Arab, Arabs. But maybe it went unnoticed. And there is a plaque, and this is where I come to. I didn't know about it. Uh, this lady, young lady from Canada, says, I've just been to Paris, and I photographed the plaque that they put on the obelisk. And there is something very weird, Mr. Boval, perhaps you can understand it. So I said, well, send me the photograph. Now, here's synchronicity. She said, I can't do it because it's a very big file. We were on, on a cruise in Egypt. I'll send it to you when I return home in Canada. She actually sent it to me on the 14th of May, but that's beside the point. I opened the picture. And I read quite correctly that on the 14th of May, President Mubarak was uh, in Paris and Chirac, uh, his name is on the obelisk, and there is the Minister of Culture of Egypt, the Minister of Culture of uh, France. But there are two names on that plaque that do not make sense. You're not going to believe whose names are on that plaque. Yves Saint Laurent and Pierre Berger. Now, you may know Yves Saint Laurent, but Pierre Berger is actually the founder of the Maison Yves Saint Laurent, the fashion house. Uh, he was actually the lover, 
they were homosexuals, the lover of, of uh, you know. now that intrigued me. Why is that name on this obelisk? And it says we'd like to thank uh, Yves Saint Laurent. Of course, you know, let's do research on this. Now you remember that the trigger, the trigger to form the Zionist organization is when Theodor Herzl went to investigate the Dreyfus affair in France during that scandal where they arrested this Jewish sergeant. You remember that story I told you? And he was so incensed by this that he formed the Zionist organization. Now here is the weird one. Pierre Berger, that year, had bought the house of Emile Zola. Emile Zola is the man, the writer who wrote J'accuse, who accused the, the, the French government. And he's converting this year, it's happening this year, that house of Emile Zola into a museum of Dreyfus Affair. Now what are the odds of Pierre Berger's name with that connection appearing on an obelisk which is celebrated on the 14th of May 1998. You work it out. It doesn't work as a coincidence to me. So what the hell is going on? But you're going to love this one. The cousin of Emile Zola, who wrote the article in 1790, was the consul of France in Egypt when the obelisk was negotiated. It is he who negotiated to bring this obelisk to France. So we have these connections. And occasionally, occasionally, in this kind of research, a little window opens. Something weird happens. This name should not be there, or in all accounts. So if you can figure out, if you can figure out what it means, you might have solved something rather odd. I'll tell you what it means to me. Because we discovered this after the Egyptian Revolution. It stunned us. We knew that President Mubarak was... Uh, exploiting his position and putting money in his pocket and all, all this. But we never knew. It was totally unthinkable that he had amassed 70 billion dollars. Let me tell you what 70 billion dollars is in case you're not. 70 billion dollars, a billion dollars is a thousand million dollars. 70 billion dollars, the United States funds the military in Egypt at the rate of one and a half billion dollars a year and it gives Israel two and a half billion dollars a year to maintain its army. President Mubarak has personally enough money to found both armies for the next 20 years. That's dangerous money. Now, what all this means, I don't want to go into this now and I'm going to run out of time. But there you are. There is a kind of strange mysticism involving strange events, but it always leads us as a message to this event that happened in 1948, the founding of the State of Israel. The Arabs are not going to let it go. The danger is that we could keep it quiet. The Americans have managed to keep it quiet for 30 years because President Mubarak was ready to play ball. Maybe that's how he got his money, I don't know. He was ready to play ball. He's no more there and the Egyptian people are no more ready to play ball. They want justice. But that justice is dangerous because Israel is saying no, and on the other side there is Iran. I'll leave it there because I'm going to hog more time. Thanks very much. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> if you have one or two questions, it's, I'll gladly take them. I think I've got f five minutes, Graham? Graham? Yeah, I do. Huh? Yeah, you have one. By the way, I run a blog, <laughs> uh, and if you go on my blog, you'll find a picture of the um, okay, see, plaque on the obelisk see. where it says Yves Saint Laurent. Or the, yeah. Sorry, I just missed the connection between the um, between the Templars and the protocols of the elders of Zion. Well, the problem with the Templars is that <coughs> they are the ones who appropriated the Temple Mount and used the Temple Mount. And that's what provoked Christianity into trying to get it. But the problem with the Templar is that whether true or not, it is believed by s many Masons that they are the founding elements of the Masonic Order. Uh, there's been many books about this, particularly with Michael Bejo and Richard Lee. It is quite possible. 
uh, it's, a, it's, it's a bit too long to go through it. Connection. And there is, in fact, Mas Masonic Templar orders in America that very commonly do processions. There was one actually in Jerusalem, of all places. Masonic Templars went dressed in Masonic and Templar regalia with the red uh, cross, and they, they did a march in Jerusalem. It's, it's quite stunning. I mean, you can see the Arabs on the other side saying, what the hell is going on? Yeah, that's it. Okay, we're going to welcome my dear friend Graham Hancock, who will now talk about spiritual things for you. Thank you very much again. Thank you. the borders to the 67 bo uh, state, uh, the president of Israel simply said no. And to me, it's an amazing situation. The most powerful man in the world, the president of the United States, was told no, I'm not going to do this. And that is a serious problem. And the reason why this no is so resounding is that uh, we have where we have a rogue state at the moment uh, armed to the hilt with nuclear power. On the other hand, we have Iran, which is dangerously coming close to having uh, nuclear power. And that is the real conflict that we might have to face. And that is the conflict we must defuse. And in order to defuse it and to save this planet, because there's a lot of things going on, but this is the one that we have to watch. But we have to diffuse it, and we have to diffuse it fast. But in order to diffuse it, we must understand the problem. And I'm always amazed that we're not understanding it. A few weeks ago, bin Laden uh, was killed. I'm showing the, the cover of the book, but in fact, what I wanted to show you, I think, comes right before it. This is a newspaper, an Arabic newspaper, published in London. It's called El Quds. El Quds in Arabic is Jerusalem. On the 23rd of February, 1998, a declaration was published. It is the declaration of jihad, of holy war, by Al-Qaeda. And in this declaration, is very clear. What astounds me is when I do give talks like this to Americans, I'm going to talk in the States lately, it's amazing how people are not aware of this. In any case, this statement literally declares war and a holy war to recapture the holy land, or rather more precisely, Jerusalem. And the enemy that is considered the enemy of this uh, organization, and still is, is not just the United States. They use a very strange word. They use the word crusaders. A couple of weeks later, here in England, uh, one of the mullahs, the Egyptian mullah uh, Hamza, the one with the blind eye that uh, we've seen so, so many times in the newspapers, made it even clearer he said, our enemy is an American Zionist Masonic enemy. Now, it intrigued me why he would see, uh, I can understand Zionist, I could understand Americans to a certain point, and we will go through it here. What I couldn't understand is why they combined this with the Freemasons. And it may sound very conspiratorial, but there is a reason why this happened. And if we don't understand it, we're not going to defuse this problem. So I want to, to do this tonight. It's not a spiritual talk, and I apologize, but it is the subject of, uh, of the master game. And I think you will enjoy it, because it takes us through a kind of uh, rat, <coughs> rat alleyways and strange places uh, that is part of this story. And here's the full article. It's on the internet, by the way. You can sort of fish it out. The story actually begins in 1000 BC, when, uh, according to uh, biblical writings, King David established the kingdom of Jerusalem in the land that we call today Palestine. 
I'll, I'll go very quickly through the, uh, the events. In 950 BC, King Solomon built the first temple. In 586 BC, Solomon's temple is destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, the first destruction of the first temple. In 515 BC, Zerubbabel starts the second temple. In 63 BC, the Romans capture Jerusalem and King Herod takes power. And this is the event that leads to uh, the uh, establishment of Christianity. And in 70 AD, the catastrophe. The Jewish revolt against Rome, it's crushed viciously by the Romans, and the second temple is destroyed. What remains, still remains today, is the Wailing Wall. That was the situation in 70 AD. So far, no problem. Palestine is in Roman hands. The temple is destroyed. The Jews start spreading. The Hebrew nation starts spreading. Uh, they begin to move around. Not so much yet. But another nation rises. In the seventh century, the nation of Islam in Arabia rises. And what you're looking here is a map of the Islamic uh, empire at around the beginning of the 7th century, the middle 7th century. The problem is there that according to the Quran, whether true or not, the Prophet Muhammad is taken by a magical horse flown from Medina to Jerusalem, alights on the Temple Mount, and from there, takes a journey into the heavens. And there he meets the various prophets. He meets Moses. He even meets God. And on his descent, declares that he has received the instructions that... Okay, welcome back, everybody. We now have uh, two keynote spe speakers for Saturday night, Robert Bouval now and Graham Hancock a bit later. So we're glad you're here to witness this. Robert has been involved in ancient Egyptology and many other subjects for the last few decades. He's done some groundbreaking research on Egypt, as you probably know from his book, The Orion Mystery, and many others such as Egypt Code. Today he's going to be discussing uh, a republish of his talisman book, The Master Game, which he actually co-authored with Graham, who's going to be speaking next. So we're going to get into some quite interesting esoteric subjects tonight. So please give a warm welcome to Robert Bouval. Uh, I'll make a little correction. Uh, there's not going to be anything esoteric or spiritual about this talk. Uh, it's exactly the opposite. But it's, it's a study that I've uh, begun uh, about 15 years ago. And uh, we decided to do a book. Uh, it was in 1997. We finally had the book published in 2006, uh, Hancock and myself. Uh, <clears throat> we published it first under the name of Talisman, uh, but we realized uh, several years later uh, that uh, the book had forced us to research a topic that... Uh, this is wonderful. I mean, I love it because this year is a lot better than the last year. Last year we had a motorcycle race outside. If you remember, the power did not work, and uh, there, were, there was some chanting with drums outside. So this is great, just music. Uh, the, uh, the topic that we had to cover uh, to write Talisman led us to uh, investigate uh, the historics behind uh, the terrible event of September 11, 2001. And now, uh, the master game uh, has incorporated uh, a couple of chapters and some rewriting because it's a book, it's a rather unusual book. It's a book that 
attempts to, well, we call it intellectual archaeology. Well, it's, it's history, the history behind the history. Uh, it was a lot of fun to research it, but it's so, um, in my view, it's a book that should uh, open up uh, a confusion that is, uh, that is causing a lot of problem today in the world. Uh, I've just returned from Egypt. Uh, some of you may know, but I was born in Egypt. I was born in 1948, uh, in the days of the monarchy. So I've witnessed the first revolution in 52, which was the, uh, the fall of the monarchy, and the placement of, the, um, of a military uh, government under Gamal Abdel Nasser, which lasted till uh, the 11th of February, which you've all witnessed on television. Uh, I've lived through all these years, uh, and what has, what has happened in the Middle East is, is, is amazing, but there's something that is not well understood, and I think, uh, or I hope, that the Master Game will, will open it up a bit. And that is, of course, the huge conflict that uh, uh, we're still facing, is the conflict between the Palestinian and the Israeli state. There is a serious problem here. There is a problem that um, we are not watching carefully. And a couple of weeks ago, the seriousness of the problem and the reality of the problem, uh, amazingly, uh, was heard on television globally when President Obama received the President of Israel. And when he proposed the need to consider seriously the return of 